Okay, so now we're back. I had closed by saying the second thing we know about Constantine is that he was astute. Astute means that you know your adversary and you know your allies and you know how to manipulate them. Now, nobody is able to do all that on his own. He has to have confederates, people close to you who have the same goal as you do and they might even hate you, but they have the same goal and they'll support you in order to get their goals realized and then once the goals are realized, then they all fight with each other. That's the story here. Maximinian can't stand Constantine. He can't stand his own son. Maximinian can, can't stand anybody. But Maximinian had married off his daughter to Constantine. Okay? So that's an alliance. Alright? Constantine knows full well that he has to distrust Maximinian. Okay? So in 308, his big concern, his primary concern and need is to consolidate his power base. Alright? So he isn't, he's got to be charismatic and he's got to be astute or people wouldn't have gathered around him. Now we begin to see how this guy Constantine exhibits the same tricks that Diocletian used. And this time to show that, I'm taking you to a book that you can buy and I recommend you do buy because I spend a lot of time talking about this guy. A book called Constantine and Eusebius by Timothy David Barnes. This guy is a major historian. He represents a minority position that claims that Diocletian died in 311, which I think that position is wrong and I spend Appendix 2 of this document here. See right here? That's Appendix 2. Supporting why T.D. Barnes is wrong to say that Diocletian died in 311. And the last three pages of Ephesians 1 we parsed are dedicated to going through the facts from 311 forward to show how Diocletian had to be alive. Because Paul indexes the third anaphora telemotos at 316. It can't be, on, it can't be by accident. So it has to be referencing Diocletian's death. But I don't use that in order to justify what I'm doing. I instead just go with the, the facts of Roman history that we have. And I show how basically I think T.D. Barnes made a couple of reading errors in the Latin. Okay, and these are all links that you can go through. It's a very long story. Like, here's Lactanius. And then here in the small print is the crux of why I think T.D. Barnes is wrong. He's misreading the super erat clause, okay, in Lactanius. That, that, that's the main reason. And there's, there's a tie to what Aurelius Vec, uh, Victor says in Latin that supports this. Okay, and it's a, it's, 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 it's a very involved thing, okay? It has a lot of points. You don't, you don't say a scholar makes a mistake without saying why. Now, it doesn't make me right, but it does mean that I, I, I spent some time reasoning it out. And Aurelius Victor has a lot to do with that. The comparison between Lactanius in Latin and Aurelius Victor in Latin, okay, is, is a lot of why um, I conclude that, that Diocletian died in December of 316, 3 December 316. And all these points are, are designed to support that. Okay, having said all that, it is nonetheless true that he writes a very, in many ways, a very scholarly thing, and he's well respected, about Constantine and Eusebius. Okay, I mean, I'm not trying to be presumptuous, but it, I really think he made a mistake when he read that Latin. But other than that, you know, there's a lot in what he says that's really important to read. In particular, to show the, the sort of um, 
astuteness and how he gathered support from 308 onward. There is this lie that he sponsors. Now whether he himself invented the lie or whether it was invented for him and he went along with it, take your pick. But the point is, is that that so-called in hoc signo vin case, vin case being the part, better Latin pronunciation with an American accent, that was already done. That game was already played right here. Where I'm moving the page, okay? Right here, right here, this paragraph right in the middle that says the speech also contains another disconcerting element. See, what, what Barnes is doing, and he starts it several pages prior, is that there is an invented, there is an, in, in order to, for Constantine to um, consolidate his power in Germain in Gaul, um, they invent a, a bloodline for him going all the way back to Claudius. Because the Gauls liked Claudius, okay? And so, when um, Constantine Chlorus dies, there's this big propaganda campaign that goes on to invent a royal bloodline for Constantine through his dad. That they start telling this story. And that story begins here in Barnes on page 35. Okay, you have a limited ability to read the book in Google. You have to buy it. Okay, and as he starts telling this story, it's very elaborate, I'm not going to go through all that. But the point is, is by 310, this is when Maximinian tries to kill Constantine, which, you know, it's debatable whether Maximinian really did try to kill him, that's the story that's told. But in 310, the story is, is, has reached its fever pitch. And the story that is told in 310, keep the dates clear, two years after he's been affirmed as Caesar, four years after he's gotten back there, 310, not 312. 312 is when he goes to Rome and defeats Maxenius. That hasn't happened yet. This is 310 when he's got to get rid of Maximian, who is Maxenius' father. This is when Maximian, the father, dies, two years prior. Two years prior, the lie is told. Now, good, get this. I can't highlight it in the new Google search. See, see, see where. Hopefully, you can see the hand. The second paragraph here, which I'm now moving to the top, it says the speech also contains another discouraging, disconcerting element, a vision attributed to Constantine. This is in 310. On his way to Massilia, the emperor made a brief diversion to what? The fairest temple in the whole world under who? Apollo. Pagan god. And what happens? Oh, next line. Constantine saw Apollo accompanied by the Greek goddess Victory offering him, Constantine, four laurel crowns, each of which signified 30 years of success, 120 years. Does that ring a bell in the Bible? Which together promised him as long a life as a man could enjoy. 120 years is how long Moses lived. 120 years is four generation curse. 120 years is Genesis 6. Okay? See how Greek culture and Hebrew culture are intertwined. Better still, Constantine recognized himself in Apollo. Young, handsome, joyful, a bringer of salvation. The world ruler whose advent Virgil foretold. Virgil was a sort of poet laureate guy that was sponsored, you know, by Rome. Okay? After his victory... This is over Maximian in 310. Constantine fulfilled the vows to the immortal gods which he had made on his journey south. See, because Maximian was controlling the territory in Africa. Maxinius only had Rome. 
Maximilian was playing both sides for and against his own son. And this time he was going back to Constantine, trying to get Constantine to ally with him. That's why he married off his daughter Fausta to Constantine. And when that didn't work out, he, he wanted supposedly to try to kill Constantine. Well, Constantine defeated the dad. The dad had control of Africa. So, back to reading page 36 here on screen. Constantine fulfilled the vows to the immortal gods, which he had made on his journey south, and showered the shrine of Apollo with lavish gifts. Remember, in Africa you had two basic competing religions. The religion of the traditional gods headed by Apollo, okay, and the Christians. So this is a slap at the Christians with what? A vision. A vision of Apollo and a vision of four laurel crowns and a vision of 120 years of victory. And so after the victory, he goes and he makes his offering to the pagan gods. You got that? I'm going to close the window now. So Constantine plays his first version of his in hoc, I call it bimbo game. Instead of signo. Okay, I'm pronouncing it like modern Italian. In hoc bimbo. You're a bimbo if you believe in hoc signo vicis. And I'm pronouncing it wrong on purpose. It's the same game as he's going to play in 312. Sucker born every minute. He just changes it. He just changes which god it is in 312. He already played it in 310. You just saw the text. Okay. That's the kind of guy he was. I mean, you know, when you're a, when you're a leader, a lot of stuff gets done that you don't want done but it's happening in your name and you get blamed for it anyway. Okay, but in order to, pr to promote propaganda like this, the leader has to go along with it because he's going to have to make speeches. You couldn't just have other people saying that stuff in his name. He'd have to be presented to the people as the object of all that propaganda in a parade of some kind triumphal procession. So Constantine went along with it. Okay? Just like there's no way President Nixon didn't know about the bunglers at Watergate. I mean, I like I liked President Nixon. I thought he had a lot of good policies, but there's no way he didn't know about Watergate. There's no way Constantine didn't know this game was being played in his name. So between two years, two stupid little years. It's Apollo in 310 and it's supposedly the God of the Bible in 312. Now what does that tell you? That tells you that Christianity was not some little far-flung small group of people you know just scattered here and there. You wouldn't have a Lactanius writing like this. You wouldn't have had all these other dingbats and Julius Africanus before him and Origen and all these guys. These guys are there and they're writing their beat up other Christian tracts because Christians were numerous, not because they were small. There were lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of Christians. Nero, back in 64, would not have blamed the Christians for the burning of Rome if there weren't a lot of Christians to blame. You don't blame a group of people for something that happened if there weren't a lot of them. Islam, you know, is the whole business with Islam and terrorists, if there weren't a lot of Muslims, this wouldn't be an issue. We wouldn't be talking about Islam so much. If there were only a couple thousand or even a couple hundred thousand in the whole world, 
we wouldn't be making an issue of, of Islam. It's because there's over a billion, uh, to, you know, one or, two, one or two billion Muslims in the world that this is an issue. So the Christians were a very large part of everybody's population. And you don't have power grabs and power fights and riding against heretics if there aren't a lot of people that you're trying to get rid of. So what this story tells you between 310, what this story tells you in 310 is that Constantine was trying to play against Christians. Why? Because Maximinian's territory Maximinian was anti-Christian and Constantine was trying to win over Maximinian's people. There were a lot of anti-Christians in Constantine's own territory. They were the major majority, okay, but they weren't such a majority that Constantine couldn't pay attention to the Christians. That's why he had a sort of laissez-faire religious policy. But at the same time, when he's talking about Apollo in 310, he's playing to the majority. But the Christians aren't a small minority. They're a significant minority. They might have, might have been 51 versus 49 percent. It might have been 60 percent pagans and 40 percent Christians. Whatever the Christians were, they were at least 30 to 40 percent of the population at that time. Had to be. Because in 310, 312, what does he do? He switches the God. So between 310 and 312, Somehow the Christians became the majority population he had to appeal to. That's how fast the growth was. Why didn't he appeal to the pagans in 312? Okay? Why did it suddenly change? Why did the propaganda change gods? It's the same kind of story that you have to look at when you're trying to date the Exodus. There was a propaganda change that tells you that it was Amenhotep II who only had nine campaigns, so he died nine years after he started. And then the next guy is who? Tutmos IV, who what? Gets this dream that he's going to take over. And he has to make a dynastic marriage because there's no army. Okay? When you see the propaganda change, you know something's going on beneath it, and you can deduce it pretty easily. It's real easy to know that Moses visited Amenhotep II, so the, the Exodus occurred in 1440 B.C. Real easy to know that. Why scholars don't know and why they misteach it is because people don't care to, to do their homework. Okay, same thing here. People who say that Christianity was just a splinter movement and there weren't very many Christians and, they, and that, that, that Christ didn't become a god until the Nicene Fathers, until Constantine went to power, they don't know what they're talking about. The Christians had to be a majority for Constantine to switch the very same vision. First he has a vision of Apollo in 310. Okay, well that tells you that the people he had to appeal to were the majority and they were pagans. Okay, but in 312, they're no longer the majority. Which means, you know, in two years, this means that the Christians in 310 were a significant minority. There was borderline who was really, you know, the majority in 310. That he uses Apollo, of course he's appealing to the Africans, in 310. But if he's still trying to appeal to the Africans in 312, he's going to have to switch it if the Christians are the minor, majority at that point. So that's what you know. Constantine, Constantine's own beliefs, well, who knows what they really were. Expediency demanded he shift it to the Christian God in 312. Now bear in mind, when he does that, he's on his way to Rome. So that also tells you that the majority in Rome proper had somehow become Christian also. Otherwise he would have played the same game with the pagan gods in order to justify his entry into Rome and killing Maxenius. Well, Maxenius actually drowns. You see, this tells you a great deal about Constantine. Constantine. And of course, in 311, he had turned 40. Like are born every minute. 
And of course, the people making up the propaganda about the sign in 312, when he, you know, takes over Rome, that's Eusebius up here. It's Eusebius who told that story. Right here. He's the one who exaggerates. That right there is the link. How he exaggerates the story about the, the, the vision. It's Eusebius who's doing the lying there. All in the name of God, therefore it's okay. Oh, we're going to sell God, so it's okay if we lie. No, it isn't. It's never okay. God doesn't need our help. So Constantine right here, you know, he's astute. I'm sure he had a lot of ability. I'm sure he was very charismatic. He's a very good military guy. But as a person, his character, no good. God doesn't mean anything to him. And God doesn't mean anything to Eusebius who told that story. And God sure doesn't mean anything to Lactanius, who also exaggerates all these stories. Okay, he, this is the, I'm sorry, it was Lactanius who told the lie about Constantine's conversion, not Eusebius. Eusebius lies, but not that story. That story has come from Lactanius, who was earlier. Okay, because Eusebius is a little bit later. Not much later. Okay, here's the lie about Constantine's conversion, which is the same story, just shifting the name of God, which God it is, which vision, same vision, oh, you're going to be, you know, you're going to be victorious if you worship me, okay? So, then we get into the rest of his machinations, which also start 310. Okay, we're now in 310. And I've had to go back to Appendix 2, which is where I spend most of my time justifying that Diocletian died at 316. That's the purpose of Appendix 2. And I have to do that because I have to illustrate why T.D. Barnes's idea of Diocletian dying in 311 is wrong. Because of Paul, um, I mean, that's the purpose of why I'm doing it, but I'm not using the fact of Paul indexing to 316 for Diocletian's death. I'm indexing only, I'm using only the history and not Paul's meter as an authority. Okay, in that I have to go through the history of the dynastic alliances and games that were played between Diocletian and his daughters and Galerius and his son and uh, his daughter actually too, because he had kids um, you know, that it weren't through uh, Diocletian's kids. Um, and, you know, all these Arab parents and all these, you know, kind of Byzantine machinations. I have to go through that. Okay, I have to shift forward a little bit in, in history to go back to 308 to 310. I first have to explain why that's important. A guy, Galerius gets really sick in 310. That's what fosters the business with Maximinian. Okay, see, what you have to know is Galerius kind of got sick the way Herod did. Okay, he was dying, according to Aurelius Victor, he was dying of a sexual disease. Okay. And so he was sick for a long time, and all this came to a head in 310. That was when the, this stuff was starting to happen. So, as you can understand, because it was happening in 310, that's why Maxentius who was Maximinian's son, got all hot and bothered. That's why Maximinian f felt he had to push the issue with Constantine, having married the daughter of, you know, Maximinian's own daughter to Constantine back in 308. But in 310, he's got to push the issue because now Galerius is dying. Licinius is the heir apparent, and Licinius is single. That really matters because Licinius being single means that Licinius can marry somebody, namely Constantia, who is Constantine's daughter. You see why all this is an issue? <clears throat> if Constantia is married off to Licinius while Galerius is sick, the Maximinian and Maxinius get cut out at this point even though Maxentius is married to Galerius's daughter also. Okay, 
the match with Constantia, especially in the wake of Maximinian's death, with now Africa under Con Constantine's control, and Galerius in the east laying dying, okay, and Licinius being single, uh-oh, <clears throat> see, Maximinian's dead. So there's a power vacuum. The so-called Tetrarchy, which is really was a plan by Diocletian to assure a, an orderly succession without all this nonsense going on, with all these intermarriages supposedly to buttress it, is falling apart. Because Galerius had named Licinius as his heir apparent, and Licinius is still single. So you see, in 310, in order to defeat Maximinian, Constantine made up that stupid vision about Apollo and his stupid, you know, alleged, you know, royal blood going all the way back to Claudius for 300 years. Yeah, right. Okay. So we have, but he has to do more than that. Yeah. And unlike since Galerius being dying, Maximinian being dead, Maxinius being allied with Galerius's daughter, okay, well, hello. If you marry the heir apparent to Constantia, who is Constantine's daughter, Diocletian is going to be in favor of that because that keeps the unity. Diocletian is like completely wacko about unity. And whenever you have a, a bid for unity, you always have a bid for tyranny and you always have a bid for war. That's exactly what the eunuch pact was designed to do, was to prevent war by preserving unity. And what it did is it gave concessions away to the Germans, all right, that produced World War II, all right? It's the same kind of junk that's going on here. It's the same kind of junk that happened between 300 and 250 BC in the intermarriages and the various pacts between the Seleucids and the Ptolemies. It's the same game. Different players, different names, different nationalities. So, our friend Constantine makes a match in 310 between Constantia's daughter and Licinius. Now, this story is really a lot more complicated because Valeria, who is now soon to be the widow of Galerius, okay, is also of marriageable age, and there's some reason to suspect that Licinius wanted to marry her instead. Okay, and I go through that in these, these pages of appendix too. You'll have to read it in detail because I don't have time to go through it all here. The point I'm trying to make here is that our boy in 310 not only invents all that story in order to make Maximinian look bad, make himself look good, but Constantine also takes care of his eastern door by marrying off Constantia to Licinius. It's not going to work, but he does it. Now Licinius, unlike everybody else, doesn't have any kids because he's single. I mean, he had he had some kid through a concubine or something from years ago, but it didn't count compared to this. And it's based on this marriage that I I seek to prove, and I think successfully, that T. D. Barnes is wrong in saying that Diocletian died in 311. This marriage basically is the key to proving that he is wrong. And I go through that in the next three pages. It takes a while. Okay, but that's the point I wanted you to see there, okay, is that when we talk about our boy making up his lie in 310, he's not only making up the lie with, with Apollo, but he's, he's cementing with Licinius because Gal Galerius is dying in 310 and dies in May 311, okay, which frees up. Valeria, his wife, who he didn't like, to be married to Licinius. And Constantine, I think, knew very well that that was a, a potential thing for her to do. And he didn't want that. So he, he, he mates his daughter Constantia to Licinius. And Licinius is thinking, you know, well, if I go to war with Constantine, I can always kill Constantia which ends up being not what happens because they end up falling in love, 
or at least she loves him. And so he hedges his bets that he can always marry Valeria later, or Valeria refuses him at Diocletian's order. I go through all those hypotheses in Appendix 2. So you can play it with that and see which one you think is most, you know, reasonable. But what this does is it reveals our character about Constantine in 310 as having already played strategic games very astutely. But obviously this guy, when he so-called converts in 312, that's fake. I mean, you know, maybe at some point he actually believes before he dies. But this was an expediency, just like getting marrying off his daughter was an expediency, just like playing the game about Apollo was an expediency, just like pretending that he was related to Claudius for 300 years was an expediency. You see that? And then here is, you know, the other thing on Barnes about saying when they think Diocletian died. And you'll have to evaluate the pros and cons of that yourself. This link right here in Scribe D is where you can get that argument from T.D. Barnes. Okay, so obviously T.D. Barnes uploaded it to Scribe D because it's f for free. Or if you go to a library, you can get it from JSTOR. So you can get some of his work for free. All right, and then it's Barnes footnote 39 that I think shows that wh why he's making a mistake. And again, I cover that in Appendix 2. Meanwhile, Okay, the point to understand here is that the reason for the advance on Rome is first because Maxentius has taken control, second because Maximinian pushed the issue due to Galerius being sick and then dying, and so Maximinian was put down by Constantine, okay, one way or another. Constantine says it was Maximinius' fault. Maybe yes, maybe no, who knows. But the point is, is that the power vacuum is opening up due to Galerius' death. So that's why Constantine arranges a marriage between Galerius' heir apparent Licinius, because Daza at this point doesn't count much. And so Constantine plays the game, takes out over Maximinian, you know, plays the game with Licinius because Galerius is dying. All right, and that sets up the potential between 310 and 311 for the takeover of Maxentius, who's Maximinius' son, who's in Rome. See, Rome is now the buffer state between the territory that Galerius is going to cede to Licinius and Constantine. Rome lies between them. Rome is still strategically important. Rome is still, you know, a, a little trophy. So Constantine is going to feel constrained, or is just plain wants to, take over Rome because Maxinius is there, and Maxinius is Maximinian's son, and Rome is in a strategic position to, to, you know, jump back to Africa and take away Constantine's gains. So that's why Constantine switches gods and has to take over Rome in order to get the troops behind him so he can take over Rome which tells you that the Christians were no longer they have to be a significant minority in 310 in order for him to assert Apollo but they had to be a majority by 312 so they weren't too small a minority here they had to be close to majority here because this is only two year span and the other thing is is that Galerius dying in 311, the territory of Galerius had a lot of Christians in it also. They were under the persecution of Galerius. So for Constantine to switch guys in 312 would end up causing the people in Galerius' territory to want to support Constantine. Okay, so we know that Africa had some major shift in Christians that was borderline already by the time Constantine plays this, of course, when he's playing this in 310, he's playing it mostly to the German audience, not so much the African. But the Africans and the eastern portion, you know, the southern part of the Mediterranean and Middle East, belong to Galerius. And there was a lot of Christian persecution that went on there. Okay, and that's, of course, where our power centers are, Antioch, Alexandria, and Rome. So that accounts for the shift in gods. Okay, 
He's going where the power is. Okay, so that takes us to the time when he actually takes over Rome, and I'll have to cover that in the next increment. Mm -hmm.